So you probably know that NERSC acquires the systems that we put on the floor for you guys to use via a competitive procurement involving benchmarking. We don't just decide in advance what we want to go at and we go and buy it. We take user workloads representing what you guys do. We create benchmark problems. We give those problems to the vendor. The vendor gives us performance, evalu performance information about those codes, which we then use in selection of those machines. Once we bring a machine in, like Hopper now, put it on the floor, it's up to you guys to a certain extent to improve your code, to go through a cycle by which you optimize the code for that architecture. But what I really want to point out here is that you, the users, in one way or another, are a very important source of performance information that flows back to the vendors. The vendors don't work in a totally isolated world. They need to know how well their machines are doing so that they can then go and internally do more performance evaluation to improve their machines, and then the cycle repeats. The overall goal, of course, generally speaking, is better science for you guys. So that's the motivation in general, but it turns out it's not so easy. You know, just a few of the issues that are associated with this process are shown here. In this course, we're going to be looking at some relatively small applications as uh, examples. When you get to a full multi-scale, multi-physics application code, it gets really difficult. We'll be the first to admit this. There are lots of ways to do the measurements. I'll talk, we'll, uh, Wu Sun and I will talk about various ways of doing that, various ways of reporting the data after you've performed the measurements. The whole problem is that the performance analysis uh, area as a science is a very broad space. There are a lot of parameters that you can vary. It's not just about a single number. It's not just, for example, measuring the performance of a code on a problem size. That simply doesn't do it. In fact, people have defined two ways of doing scalability analyses. You may have heard these terms uh, in various contexts. We might call them strong scaling, in which we take the physical, the, the global problem, and it remains constant, and we add processors to it at that point, in which case, hmm, I think this is an error. The amount of memory and uh, what's going on on a single processor will change uh, as we add processors. And then the opposite case is where we do scaled speed up, where we keep the global size of the problem growing proportionately with the number of processors that we're adding, hoping that the execution time will remain constant as we do that. There are a variety of pitfalls that abound in the way that you report performance information. And really, the objective is for you guys to become performance skeptics. It is to regard the literature that you see or people, other people's reports of performance with a certain degree of skepticism so that you can relate it to reality. About 15 years or so ago, Dave Bailey from the Berkeley Laboratory published somewhat uh, tongue-in-cheek paper called 12 Ways to Fool the Masses when uh, reporting performance results. It was a, a long time ago. Most of those ways are still valid. It turns out uh, two months ago he updated that paper to give uh, this basically the same sort of view of performance analysis but on architectures that are more relevant today. And At the end of the talk, I'll give you the reference to that work. One of those ways, just as an example, is that when you're looking at the scalability of a code, it's important that your reference point be the best uniprocessor algorithm, not necessarily the power algorithm measured on a single processor. I advise you, throughout the work that you do, be careful relying on any single number to fully characterize the performance of your code. And of course, we can't forget about Amdahl's law. So some of the questions we seek to answer are shown on this slide. And I'm here to tell you as a prelude that Wu Sun will actually have answers to these questions uh, as shown here. What you basically want to know is, can you tell if your program is performing as well as it should be? That is to say, is it mapped well to this particular architecture? Or if not, can we say how well it's mapped and why isn't it mapped as well as it might be? Can we identify the causes within the code 
And then can we think about what we might do to improve the performance? And as I say, Wusan will answer those questions for you within the context of the Cray tool. Now, uh, both John Schauf and Richard talked about computer architecture, but so I won't go into this very much, but again, the key issues that we'll be considering are the fact that the global computer, uh, uh, computer architecture consists of essentially individual computer units tied together via some network mechanism. And then within one of these units, we have an increasingly deepening memory hierarchy. And this is really where the performance is uh, affected the most on a single processor basis. And it's this interconnect that affects the performance on a global basis. And we'll have methods of probing both of those areas with the tools. Now, once we start probing, we have to have a way of reporting the results. There are countless talks and papers out there about what types of performance metrics you should use. By far, the optimal one it really is the time to run the application. That's, in a sense, that's really all you care about. You want to minimize the amount of time it takes to run your code. However, the problem with that is, even if you know that number, even for a group of uh, uh, runs, it gives relatively little indication of how well your code is mapped to a given architecture. It doesn't tell you about efficiency. Therefore, there are all kinds of other derived metrics which are basically based on time with some sort of normalization factors such as floating point operations or number of instructions. There are also indirect measures that we could use such as scalability, speed up, parallel efficiency, and all of those. And those give you an indication of how well the architecture is performing, but again, the thing you care about the most is your application time. Whoops, I think I skipped. So when we start using some of these tools, sorry, I'm on slide nine now for the remote people. When you start using these tools, there are three basic kinds of things that you're going to want to measure, or three questions you want to ask. How many, how long, and how much are basically the types of data that you can get out of these performance tools. And I've given examples here from the MPI library or from an MPI send routine. You can ask the question, how many calls did I send, did I, uh, of those type did I have in my code? How much time was spent in them? What was the duration? And what size of message was sent? And of course, these are all indirect measures of performance, but are nevertheless important for you to understand how well your code is mapped to the architecture. And the reason for that is shown on the lower part of this slide. Richard yesterday talked about the definition of latency and bandwidth. And what I'm showing you here are visual interpretations of those two terms. In fact, the time to send an MPI message is a linear function, which is shown in this graph here. TS is the latency that Richard mentioned yesterday. And TW is a time per byte or a time per word. So the, phys the uh, graphical interpretation of this is that the time to send a message of length L is equal to a startup time, which is the y-intercept of this line. And the slope of it is the cost per word or the bandwidth. A totally equivalent way of looking that, at this is shown on the right side. All I've done is take the reciprocal of time, and I'm now looking at a rate that is something like megabytes per second as a function of message size. And if it's a logarithmic scale, you see an S curve that looks something like this one. I should probably be using the pointer. But the bottom line is you want to know for your code where am I on this curve? If my message size is only 100 bytes or so, I'm only going to be getting 100 megabytes per second, whereas I might be able to get 4 gigabytes per second if my message size were at this asymptotic limit. So you want to know basically where you sit in terms of that type of analysis. And the tools that we'll talk about today will give you that information. Again, that does not fully characterize your code's performance, but it's an indication of what possibly some of the problems might be in mapping to a given architecture. Now, when we start to talk about performance data collection, which is really what this whole talk is about, 
there are two dimensions that are important. And the first one is shown on this slide. That dimension is what type, when the data are collected, or how it is that the data collection is triggered. And there are two approaches to this. And I have to be honest with you, I've been doing performance analysis for many, many years. I never worried about these sort of terms, okay? You can happily analyze the performance of your code without knowing this. The reason we have it in here is if you look at the man pages for the Cray tool that we'll be talking about, they mention this quite a bit. So you may want to know the terminology. And what it simply comes down to is, is the performance analysis triggered internally within your code or externally by some other agent? And in fact, that external agent is basically the operating system. My virtual hand, and the question from the audience is, should, yeah. should not memory usage be a metric as well? Absolutely. There are lots of derived, uh, okay, there are lots of derived metrics uh, that I'm not mentioning here, uh, except that memory usage is one of the things that you can me uh, measure using the tools that we'll talk about. It's definitely important. It's some very frequently a trade-off that performance and memory usage are inversely proportional, but it's one of the constraints that we have to live with. My voice is dying, unfortunately. Okay, so two types of way uh, of uh, triggering the data analysis, asynchronously or synchronously. So basically what I'm talking about with asynchronous here is that you run the code and periodically the operating system interrupts your code extremely briefly and does some measurement. Okay, so it's totally out of the control of when it happens with regard to your code. It turns out it's very easy to do this. It's very low overhead, and so there's a, a useful, uh, sometimes a useful way of doing this. And if I can do this now, what I'd like to do is show you an example of it. It turns out that you don't need to know anything about your code in order to do this type of analysis. And I'm going to show you an example of that. On this Macintosh computer, I'm switching apps. On this Macintosh computer here that's being used for displaying these view graphs, I'm going to do a sampling and analysis on an application called Firefox. I have no idea what's in Firefox. But here it is. I'm going to tell the Macintosh to do a sampling analysis on Firefox. It was done. There it is. So it, unfortunately, there isn't very much that you can see here. I'll scroll down. But it, there are a bunch of different threads. And here are all the routines that it sampled. And what that basically means is it interrupted Firefox every so often. What, I don't know exactly what it was. I think it was one millisecond. And it said, where is Firefox right now? And it collected those information, and it's essentially putting them out here as a histogram. These are the number of samples. This is the, the routine that was found each time. And then there are a bunch of threads that are shown there as well. And now I need to go back to my presentation. So the important thing about sampling is that it's very low overhead, and it can be done very easily. The other way of doing it is with the uh, data collection triggered internally to your application, that is to say synchronously, and it's called tracing. It's done on an event-by-event -event basis, and it's done via a process called instrumentation that I will then talk about momentarily, because this really is the subject for the rest of our talk. There are, instrumentation is the process by which we take a code and we add some sort of measurement probe to it to observe its execution. Generally, a few instructions, or we do something during the execution of the code to observe what it's doing. Now, there are lots of ways of doing uh, instrumentation, some of which are shown on the right side of this view graph. We could instrument the source code. An example of that is shown on the next slide. Maybe you, many of you have already done this already. Here's some code that I run where the total time to run this code 
total here is 17.8 seconds, and I've actually included timers around several of the other routines in my code. This gets tedious if you have a lot of routines in your code. So really the objective, the thing that we've evolved to with all these tools in computer science and HPC over the last few years is to allow instrumentation to allow performance measurement without having to modify the source code. And that's what we'll be talking about. So if I go on to the next slide now, which is slide 13, it's actually a repeat of the slide I had momentarily, uh, a moment or so ago. And we're going to talk about some of the other ways to do performance instrumentation. The compiler is an excellent source of performance instrument of performance info. It knows basically everything that's going on in your code. And Wusun will have a very brief description of how you can use the compiler to instrument your code. Libraries would be a good place to do instrumentation. For example, the MPI library can be instrumented so that when you call MPI send, you, there's actually a wrap routine that intercepts that call. It takes some of the performance instrumentation and executes it and then calls MPI send and returns back to your code. What we're going to be talking about uh, largely in this talk is instrumenting the executable. And it's going to be instrumenting the executable before you run it. So it's called static in instrumentation. And we're going to be using a tool to do that. And moving on. Oops. So again, the, to the approach that we're going to take is to take, use some tools, some software, to transform the binary executable after you compile it, but before you run it, to include hooks, as they say, for various types of measurements. Then you're going to run that instrumented executable. It's a different file. And those instrumented that instrumented executable will capture the various events that you had determined to begin with and write out a raw data file. Then you, you're going to use a different tool or perhaps tools to interpret the raw data file that was written out. That's the basic process. Now, remember I said there were two dimensions about this. The first was how the performance data are triggered, or when the performance data are triggered. The second dimension is now you've collected those data, you've written them out to the disk, how do we present them? And there are basically two ways of doing that. The very common way is called profiling. And that is simply to do some sort of statistical combining of all the sampled events over time. It's sort of like creating a histogram that tells you what happened as a function of time statistically as the program was executed. And typically, we do this with some knowledge of the code. So we can look at the functions or the loops or the basic blocks or even user-defined sections of the code. And Wusun will talk about that. The good thing about this, it's really low overhead. It's very easy to do. And Wusun will have lots of examples. This is called hotspot analysis sometimes. There was a, a person many years ago called this bottlenecology, the study of bottlenecks. The other way of doing this is to write out a trace file. That is to say, this is exactly what happened as I ran my code on a global time a global timeline all the way across every single event basically that happened. Gather each of these time stamped events and sometimes with some knowledge of who called them and what their arguments were. This is really useful for learning what your code does but not necessarily useful for determining how well the performance is. And I'll have a, an excellent example of how to do this in the apprentice section of the tutorial later on. Some of the difficulties have been mentioned earlier today in John Schauf's talk. You have to be very careful about the tool overhead. How do you know if the performance that you're seeing in the tool is due to your code or is it due to the overhead associated with the tool? You have to be careful that the tool is going to present you with enormous volumes of data. It's still up to you to interpret it. You know the code better than the tool. So, but the code, that means the tool is just going to see your code in totality. You may have some idea where to hone in on it. There are lots of approaches, as we've talked about. I haven't mentioned this yet, but there are lots of tools that are available. One of these tools that Wusun is going to talk to you today represents an excellent approach to overcome some of these difficulties, particularly this one. 
He's going to talk about using the tool to do some automated analysis of, the to of your code, attempting to include some intelligence within the tool to narrow the focus. But in general, all of these problems remain. Now, some of the tools that are available to do this sort of work at NERSC, you've heard about these already. Integrated performance monitoring, there'll be a talk about this by Dave Skinner afterwards today. Vendor tools, unfortunately, the main vendor tool we have at this point, not unfortunately, but there's only one vendor tool nowadays. IBM, I believe, does not have anything approaching uh, Craypad. There are a variety of community-supported tools. They're not necessarily given full support at NERSC. The Tau tool is supported by uh, a group called the Advanced Computational Toolkit Society. I forget what ACTS stands for. There's another tool that we've just started experimenting called, uh, with called Open Speed Shop. Another one, uh, HPC Toolkit, it's installed, but it doesn't, it's not supported. And then underlying all of these tools is something called the Performance Application Programming Interface, or PAPI. And with that, oh, sorry, one more uh, definition, the uh, difference between inclusive and exclusive profiling time. I think it's probably obvious if you have a code where uh, main calls several uh, different subroutines, you want to look at the amount of time spent in main by itself or the amount of time spent in main, including the calls to F1 and F2. And that's the difference between inclusive and exclusive.